Hello and welcome to this episode of Demystified as we explore home cooking in a modern world. Hello, I'm Linda and I'm here with my friend Paul. Hi Paul. Hello Linda. I know my name and I know your name. <laughs> Yay. It's a, we're on a roll. We're back on track. <laughs> How are you? I'm all right. You're going to ask me something today. I can I tell. Am. I can feel it in my I, bones. You can, you can tell by the look of my face. I have. Well, I've been thinking about this because the other day you were testing a couple of ovens. Yep. And you did uh, cook a very nice... It's always interesting when I find that you, what you cook in a test oven to test the temperature and to test the cooking. And the chicken was very nice. You said it was plain, but it was still really nice. But the thing that you made that I loved were the Anzac biscuits. And for those listeners who don't know what an Anzac biscuit is, it's a biscuit with... History lesson, warning. Right, no, no. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not... History was never my strong suit, but it's made out of rolled oats and golden syrup and sugar and um, a little bit of flour. No flour. Okay, I obviously don't know what's in an Anzac biscuit. Butter. Okay. Coconut. All the yummy things. So why do they exist? Sorry? Oh, because they were part of the biscuits sent over to um, the war effort. Yeah. To the soldiers back in the Australia and New Zealand. So they were made here and could Uh, be sent almost anywhere because they kept. But there's a real... um, There's a real divide between people who like their Anzacs hard and crunchy that you can then dip into coffee and tea. Yep. And those like me mm-hmm. who like them with that sort of chewy softer base and you made them just the way I like them and that sort of opened up in my mind thinking how come some biscuits that you make uh, we you know when I make Anzac I'll make them like you know every time I make it it's always a surprise to me whether they're going to come out soft and chewy or... consistency is key <laughs> you're getting a job in a restaurant not <laughs> Yes, that's why I'm an accountant. Um, but sometimes they're chewy, sometimes they're hard and crunchy, mm. and sometimes you cannot break those little buggers. So I'm just wondering, what is the secret? Or is there a, is there a knack? Is it the, is no, it there's the a method? Secret. There's a secret. Yeah. Are you willing well, to share? Well, it's not a secret as such. Are you willing so, to share that secret with us and our are, listeners? Yeah, there are a couple of things at play here. One is... Uh, the volume and quantity of your what end up being your liquid ingredients um so that will often play a part in how quickly they color number one and therefore how quickly they cook and how quickly and how much chew the anzac will have but i have found and if you are telling me that you have found the same thing which is you have the same recipe and it the only variable is that sometimes some are crunchy and sometimes some are chewy. There is a very good reason as to why. So the method of making an Anzac biscuit it couldn't be simpler, right? You mix your dry ingredients in one bowl and in a saucepan, you put your butter, your golden syrup. That's about it. And you heat those two things. In a traditional Anzac biscuit, there is baking powder or bicarb soda. Bicarb, I use bicarb. Some people use baking powder, but there is bicarb soda. Now, what a lot of people do is add the bicarb to the dry ingredients because it's a dry ingredient. But what I have done for a long time now is once I melt my butter, because you want it fully melted, and warm my golden syrup because you mix those the warm ingredients with your dry ingredients, I actually bring my golden syrup and butter almost to the boil, so quite hot, and I dilute my eight grams, according to my recipe, my eight grams of bicarb soda in 20 mils of water. And then what I do is I remove my hot butter and golden syrup from the heat, and I add that diluted bicarb. And what happens is, is because it's hot and it's a fat and it's sugar as well, the bicarb reacts and starts to foam. Like honeycomb. Correct. 
Aha, so yeah, I do pay attention. So when it foams, and as soon as it foams, I then add that entire batch of butter golden syrup that is now foamed up into my dry ingredients and mix from there. And that is how you get chewy Anzacs. Well, thank you. So I what it's, it's creating false volume, essentially, because you're essentially aerating it, okay? Yep. And it creates a false volume. So the mixture is much easier to mix because you've got what is perceived as more volume. It isn't. It's the, it still weighs the same amount, but we've added an ingredient that has aerated it, but it has given it more volume to a degree, although it weighs the same. Um, but by doing it in that method, that's how you get a good chew in your Anzacs. Otherwise, if you add your bicarb with the dry ingredients, because it's mixed in with so much other stuff, being coconut, rolled oats, sugar, it's mixed in with so many other things that it doesn't have a chance to react when you pour the butter on it because it's now spread throughout a whole huge volume of other ingredients, whereas having it concentrated and pouring it into the butter gives it a chance to work. So it's doing the job that it was intended to do, but if you add it to the dry ingredients, you're not giving it a chance to do that. I had no idea about that. Well, there you are. In fact, all the years I've made Anzacs, I don't think I've ever had it suggested that you do it that way. Oh, well, there That's you go. Really good. Well, yeah. thank you, because I didn't know why. And um, Doug, well, Dougie is not a big fan of Anzacs. He ate those, I bet. He, uh, when I said to him, oh, well, you have something else, and I'll have one with my uh, after-dinner cup of tea. And, Shit, right, um, cup of tea. There's Dougie, a lie. And Dougie's uh, <laughs> like, oh, well, I'll just try one since, you know, Paul made it. I said, well... They're pretty good, but, you know, all right. Because he doesn't eat them at home. He never eats them. Mm. And uh, he said, yeah, these are better than average. Well, I which mean, means I was... then ate the rest. Yeah. I was doing it because they're a good indicator of... Um, because they're spread out on a tray when you bake them, you spread them out quite a distance away from each other and across multiple levels. That's why I use them for testing ovens because it gives a good indication of how if the, each individual biscuit is weighed the same it gives a good indication of how well the oven's baking from front left corner back right corner top bottom up down back forward it shows how evenly an oven can bake across multiple levels in multiple places across the cavity so that's why I choose something like an Anzac. It's just a good visual indicator for me because they're, it's also quick. So they only cook for eight to 12 minutes or something like that. So and now she's taking notes, people. No, no, I've actually, there were actually two things that you, uh, I know, <laughs> that's the first time ever during the podcast, but there were two things that you mentioned that I thought I'd like to really explore with you leading on from there. One is the difference between bicarb and baking powder. powder. And the second one is, I think it's a really good thing that maybe everybody, because we get asked a lot about new ovens and what, you know, when they've got a new oven, what do you cook? And you always try, if it's a steam oven, try to, you know, suggest some simple steam things mm. that get, you know, confidence going. But in a general sense, cooking a tray of biscuits, because one of the things you do know, and you know, like I know in my ovens, the back left-hand corner is by far the hottest, quickest place to cook. Yeah. And I've got to keep rotating things around if it's a longer cook. So it's probably a good thing for people who've just bought an oven, any sort of oven, to try and put a, a different racks of biscuits in. I mean, get, ideally, get for it. yeah, ideally you want to, especially if you've bought a new combi steam oven, you want it to be baking pretty evenly. Mm -hmm. um, but like anything else, you working with different heating elements of different sizes across different brands with different cavities so like yeah everyone manufactures differently well yeah pretty much so uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, you've got a bad oven if the back left hand corner cooks a little bit harder than the no. front right hand no, corner no, no. Um, but there needs to be an element of accuracy about when you do do that. So that's probably a little bit of a tutorial lesson because it's not just plonking 
a couple of Anzacs on a baking tray. I actually measured distances from that corner. Of yeah, course, and it's part of, of my job. It's part of my job. I know, but, but from, I measure the distance. So if oh, my baking tray is rectangular, yeah. And the end of the baking, sorry, I'm drawing. This is really good I know, for, a yeah, podcast. for a podcast. <laughs> but I'm measuring from the back edge of the baking tray in and from the left edge in. So those two measurements, and that's got to be mimicked here. Which is, Paul's now pointing yeah. to the front right. Front hand. right, or the back right. Or the back right. Yeah. yeah. So the back right hand side and the back right hand edge. So I, it's not just a matter of plonking it on there. Because this is my part of my job, I actually lay them out evenly. Everything is weighed to the gram, so it gives me a pretty good indicator of how okay. well things are baking. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it'll give you an indicator, but really, well, you need to do that. Yeah, like for I, me, yeah. it just helps that I know if I'm doing a like even with some of the biscuits that I cook. I will tend to put the bigger ones at the back because like, I don't weigh things out. I just yeah. grab and mix. Yeah, but who does, right? No, so, and so I know that yeah. the, I'll put the back, the bigger ones on the back and the smaller ones in the front because I know then I'll get a pretty even cook. But only because I know my, so, my oven cooks quicker at the back. We've talked about something similar before, but I'm going to repeat myself to a degree. You make, and I know you make uh, white chocolate cookies. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. They got white chocolate bits in them. I've yeah, never exactly. made that recipe, I don't know, don't care. They're good biscuits, right? Well, thanks. Here's the thing, and you say you never weigh them out. But the stupid thing is, and this comes back to the volume conversation we had maybe last week or the week before on another oh, yes, podcast. Yes, yes, yes. Right? So you don't know and you visually go, okay, these are ones bigger, so they're gonna to go towards the back of the oven, but you can actually solve this problem quite easily. So if you add up the volume of ingredients that you have, and let's say the entire volume equals 600 grams. Mm -hmm. So your biscuit base is 600 grams. Yeah. And you take one, one piece of that dough and roll it and go, that looks about the right size that I would like, and weigh that one dough one piece of dough that's going to give you a weight of 20 grams 30 grams so you now have... you know how many biscuits correct very good I am good at maths <laughs> yes I know and that's the thing right okay. so now you should know out of that 600 grams if one weighs 20 grams or 30 grams or whatever it might be and that's the right size for you you should end up with 20 biscuits mm -hmm. and if you only end up with 15 or 12 you've got some serious size differences going on and you're not going to get an even bake. There's no chance. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's interesting. And that's nothing more than like, no. the, that's nothing more than I must actually have spending time that. going, okay, I'll pull a bit of dough out of that one yeah. and then re-roll it and I'll pull a bit of dough out of that one. And then if you take your biscuit base and you just get a pastry cutter and you divide that mix into four even sizes, out of those four even pieces, how many biscuits do you need to get out of those four? Six, mm. eight. Yeah. So you get eight biscuits out of each quarter. Yeah. You end up with your 20 or 30, whatever it is. Okay. I've never tried that, but I, I can see I'm going to do that next time I make those biggies mm. or my Anzacs with my new method. That's but to your other point, bi, uh, bi bi carb and baking, and baking powder. NFI. I don't know. I honestly don't know. I don't know what the difference is. But you don't, you put in different... They're both... They're both raising agents, yeah. Um, but the actual chemical difference that they have when you are cooking with them, I've got no idea. Baking powder for me is something that goes into flours and and stuff like that to help. Like I turn, I will often turn plain flour into self-raising by adding baking powder. Okay. I wouldn't be using bicarb for the same thing um, because I don't know the, for want of a better term, the activity of both of them. Mm -hmm. Like I know for, well, off the top of my head, for like 100 or 200 grams, I can't even remember, if you add a quarter teaspoon of baking powder to 100 grams of plant flour or whatever it is, whatever the recipe is, that then turns it into self-raising flour. Okay. But if I was to do the same with bicarb, I don't think I'd get the same result. And bicarb tastes, you can taste bicarb. Baking yeah. powder is almost flavourless. Like if you make some honeycomb, like we were talking about before, you can 
if you don't cook it out properly, you can taste it. And to be honest with you, like we use bicarb to clean sinks and it's all manner of things. Soak my feet in it when they're really sore. Aww. No, it's really good. Is like it? bicarb's really good for a lot of stuff. Okay. Um, but in the case of your Anzacs, I think it in that scenario, maybe it reacts more to a liquid heat. I don't actually know. Okay. I'll, I'll, this is something I will research and I'll get back to you later. Interesting. I'm going to write this down. We're all writing today. Wow. It's a good thing we're on a podcast and people can see what we're doing. <laughs> well, that's interesting. I, I must admit, I don't know the difference either, but I know I've got bicarb. Thanks for the question without notice too. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> Pleasure. I know I've got bicarb in my pantry, but I don't think I've got any baking powder. Yeah, I've always got both. Yeah. But the funny thing is, is we will go through kilos of bicarb soda before we go through a tiny 100 gram jar of baking powder. Okay, yeah. But we, I use it for all sorts of stuff. It's really good. It's a really good cleaning agent. Really good for stainless steel. Well, I do, I do use it into cleaning the steam oven. Yeah. Yeah, like, I've done always. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The other one I just want to briefly mention, and I know we've talked about this before, I did, I've did. i recently done a lot of digging into uh, descalers, like the cleaning oh, yes, agents yes. used in descalers. Yeah. Now, I'm not suggesting that this is for everyone, but the bulk majority of the ingredient in a descaler for a steam oven is citric acid. It costs about a dollar to buy a massive jar of citric acid and you can descale your steam oven with it. Just dilute it in the reservoir and away you go. I know you've done that on our steam oven at the time yep. and nothing nothing bad happened. No. No, nothing. Yeah. No. So I'm not suggesting that that works for everyone. I know there's some very specific oven, ovens. Gaggin now I've got a special cartridge which you have okay. to use. Um, but... For those people out there that maybe have an older steam oven that don't want to fork out $12 for a descaling tablet or liquid that takes six years to arrive from the supplier, citric acid kind of does the same job, pretty much. So, yeah, citric acid to do your descale. And you can buy that from any uh, good shopping... Supermarket. Supermarket. <laughs> like any good shop. Get it in the baking section in the supermarket. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, yeah. citric acid. There citric acid, go. yeah. And it works really well in um, to stop oxidisation of fruits and food and stuff like that. So if you're making a guacamole at home or an avocado puree or something like that and you haven't got any lemon to stop it going brown, just put a little pinch of citric acid in it. It'll taste like lemon, but it stops it going brown, just like lemon, because it's citric acid. Wow, I yeah. didn't know that either. Okay. Well, that's a good thing to have. Yeah. So in the cupboards as well. I don't even know why that came into my head. It just did. But yeah. So Discovery. everyone's going to go out now and buy citric acid, bicarb soda, and baking powder. Be like some maybe sort of not so much baking bottle. powder. <laughs> <laughs> maybe not so much baking powder. Well, maybe maybe maybe, maybe once we know what they do, we will. Well, it will help. We can then you know further talk about it, but. So does that method of mixing the bicarb, back to our first topic, does that method of mixing the bicarb into the hot ingredients work for other biscuits that have a need for bicarb? That if they have bicarb in the, in the mix, <coughs> would you do that with all your bicarb mixes in biscuits to make them chewy? Mm, or is it just well, Anzacs? Yeah, I don't know. I haven't probably tested it on enough to be able to say 100% that's the way I would do it. But in my mind, it makes sense to me that if I put bicarb soda into a large volume of other ingredients, like flour and sugar and coconut and oats or whatever the mixture mix, mix is, so mm -hmm. it's going into a bowl and it's generally you are talking five, eight, 10 grams with 100, 200, 300 grams. So it's going into a bowl with a whole massive volume of other stuff and it gets mixed around. So that eight grams or 10 grams of bicarb is now in amongst another two or 300 grams of dry ingredient. And then I add some warm liquid ingredient to make my biscuit dough. Is the bicarb gonna react because it's so... Yep. Makes sense. So yeah. spread out. I don't know. 
Okay. But the question then comes down to your original question is, what do they actually do and how do they react to heat? Because maybe does maybe does something happen when, even though it's mixed, then you put it in the oven? I just find that with Anzacs, if you don't do that, you don't get that nice chewy centre. Which is just... And for those listeners who aren't in Australia who may not have access to golden syrup, um, is who there an equivalent? Have access to I don't know. Syrup. Is it in America? Do oh, you have, yeah. Would it be yeah, the same? Yeah, golden syrup. You could use maple syrup if you really wanted maple to. Maple syrup, yeah? yeah. Okay. Bit sweet though, so you'd probably pare back the sugar. Yeah. Golden syrup's not sweet like maple syrup is. But who doesn't have access to golden syrup? I don't know. But yeah, I can't I just don't make assume, stuff up. Yeah, I just don't know. No, no, but wow. I don't assume everyone's got you know, No, I think golden syrup's pretty Is it pretty universal? Common. Yeah, I'd suggest. Okay. Yeah. Well, it could not be. I wouldn't, wrong. like, bust out the molasses. That's not something that I'd get into. No. A bit dark, a bit too cooked. Yeah. Like, because it's just cooked sugar, effectively. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I'm pretty sure golden syrup's universal. Okay. But well, you could try. We, do you know what? I'm, I will make some maple syrup Anzacs. We'll, we'll form the alliance: <laughs> Australia, New Zealand, and, and Canada, the Commonwealth. Yes. Hey. I mean, I know on, it's com- I know it's Commonwealth. Yeah, the Commonwealth. Yes, we are. There you go. Yes. I think we're still on the Commonwealth, and I think Canada still yeah. are as well. We did the Empire pudding. Oh, that's right. For Christmas, I'm going to make the Commonwealth biscuit. Hey. Need to put something Malaysian in there. You can't substitute honey with it, can you? Bit sweet. But yeah. you know, potentially you could, right? Potentially. You're talking about liquid volumes of something. Yeah. So what you're changing there is yeah. the flavour, but you're not changing No, and for the those liquid people who've never had an Anzac, please Give go it a go. and try one. Give yeah. it the good Aussie go. <laughs> you, you patriot, you. Oh, I'm so patriotic, aren't I? Seriously. Oh. Well, thank you for that. Yeah, that was a bit long-winded. No, no, but that was good because I was uh, very impressed when you first brought them in and they were warm out of the oven. What is nicer? But uh, they were chewy. So I'll be expecting Anzacs on Monday. Oh, what, me? Usually the weekend to do it. Who, me? You're the chef. It's my birthday. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) Big ask, I know. Do some Anzac biscuits. Do some Anzac biscuits. Do some Anzac biscuits that take eight minutes. I know. That's a commitment, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Oh, gee, special. Well, and. I'm um, joking. But it'd be nice for us to be able to show. Yes. our, Our listeners, if they want to look on our social medias. Linda's chewy hands. Well, my, my, seriously. Yeah, well, I don't have to do it. Felt, I'm under pressure now, buddy. Alrighty, I'll give it a go. There you go. Alrighty, well, um, thanks for that. Thanks for giving me some homework. No worries. Well, me too. Bicarb, baking powder. I'm on it. Cool. Alright, we'll be in touch. Well, happy cooking, everybody. Speak to you later. Thanks for that. See ya. Bye. Thanks for listening to this podcast as we explore home cooking in a modern world. We'd love you to subscribe, and for more information, please go to our website, cookingwithsteam.com.